Welcome everyone to FACT's webinar called Operating a Meet CSA Tips for Running a Successful Program. I am uh, Larissa McKenna, uh, Humane Farming Program Director at Food Animal Concerns Trust and our Fund a Farmer Project. This webinar is presented by Jim Bourne and Holly Browder and is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. So I will be moderating the webinar this evening and I thank you all for joining us. A few quick introductions before we, we launch in. Um, Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, is a national nonprofit organization. We are headquartered in Chicago, and we promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct FACT's Fund a Farmer Project, which awards grants and facilitates peer-to-peer -peer farmer education to increase the number of animals that are raised humanely. And this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. At this point, I'm delighted to introduce our two presenters, both of whom are also past Fund a Farmer grant recipients. So our first speaker tonight will be Jim Bourne of the Lambs Quarter, a historic farm in Owings, Maryland, which uh, from uh, my Google map is a, approximately an hour east of Washington, D.C. In 2004, Lambs Quarter received a Fund a Farmer grant from FACT to build additional housing for their hens on pasture. And tonight, Jim will talk about his experience raising animals that are sold directly to consumers and his insight about marketing his farm's meat and egg CSAs. Our second presenter speaker this evening is Hallie Browder of Browder's Birds Pastured Poultry Farm on Long Island in New York. Uh, Browder's is a two-time Fund a Farmer grant recipient. In 2013, uh, FACT awarded Holly and her husband Chris a fund a farmer grant to install fencing, which enabled both of their both their laying hens and their broilers to be on pasture and to be moved as needed. And then in 2014, Browders received a grant to support their pilot project to market pasture raised chicken to local chefs on Long Island. This evening, Holly will talk about the nuts and bolts of her farm CSA program, including some of the benefits, challenges, and ideas uh, for attracting members. So we're very lucky to have both of them with us this evening to talk about and share their knowledge and expertise. And like I said, they will be available to answer your questions later in the webinar. At this point, I am going to pass the mic over to Jim for our first presentation. So take it away, Jim. Hi, how are you all doing? Uh, I'm Jim Bourne uh, from the Lambs Quarter Farm, and I'm really happy to be with you all this evening. I um, want to get started with uh, the, the first basic question, what is a CSA? CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. It grew out of a movement that started in Europe back in the 1980s, kind of popped the big pond, as they might say, and landed in New England, uh, the Northeast area. And it was primarily um, produce oriented. And the concept was that um, People who were not farmers, but were concerned about food, where the food was coming from, would um, join up with a farmer, uh, pay them money up front at the beginning of the season when times are real lean. And in exchange for that money throughout the season, they would get regular vegetables. Either they would go to the farm, pick it up, or it would be delivered to them. Most of the farms in the early days, um, there was a, a big work share um, incentive where the members of the CSA would come to the farm and help out with uh, crop production, picking, weeding, and that kind of thing. So a CSA is really a partnership between the grower and the eater, but it's also a financial arrangement. And for many, many farmers now, that is um, a, a very attractive thing to get money up front in the lean months. And uh, if you all are farmers out there, we're sitting in February. Uh, this is a pretty lean month uh, financially. So if you have checks coming in right now in the mail, signing up uh, for, your, for a CSA or a share of your produce or your meat, that means an awful lot right now. So that is um, why have a meat CSA. Uh, you, there's that financial aspect, upfront money. Um, 
And you can look at it as alternative banking, non-traditional funding, or a little phrase I came up with is layaway in reverse. Um, but there is a question that you, you need to ask yourself in terms of how, when you're thinking about a CSA and how you're going to structure the financial arrangements. What can you borrow money for from a bank? What is foreign credit going to charge you if you go down there and talk with your loan officer? Five, six percent? Is it higher than that? But well, what you want to do is be able to give that discount to your uh, shareholder. Um, is it going to be 5%? Is it going to be 6%? Is it going to be 10%? You have to work that out, and we'll get through a little bit of that um, in a, a few slides down the road. Another aspect is that you want to expand your market. Uh, you want to bring new customers in. So um, if you're doing a farmer's market, you don't necessarily want to turn all of your farmer's market customers into CSA members because um, you're going to lose money. So you want to bring new customers in. It's okay if some of your market customers come because they may buy more stuff because of their membership, of their membership in the CSA, but you want to expand your marketing. And of course, you need to have the product to be able to um, to give to your customers. So surplus product, um, we're planning uh, for surplus product is essential. So for us at the Lambs Quarter, eggs are pretty much a pioneer product in a new market. Um, if you have someone who's never bought from a farm before, never done a CSA or farmer's market, Eggs are usually the first thing I recommend that people try because the cost is low. It's an easy way to, to try something new. There's not a lot of risk in, involved. But if you're in egg production, and I may be speaking to a lot of people who have chicken laying hens, you know that eggs are feast or famine. So you either have too many or you don't have enough, and it's hard to get that Goldilocks moment where everything is just right. So you've got to have a plan with your eggs. You've got to have a plan to replace your laying hens. When are they going to drop off? How long do you want them in production? Remember, every egg has to get touched, at least on our farm, three times. So there's not an awful lot of efficiency in egg production. Eggs and broilers, uh, this is a shot of our um, a broiler house. This is Chicken Palace. 3.1, and you're going to hear that theme as I click through the slides. We're always trying to figure out a way to better our, uh, our pasture poultry housing. Um, when we started off with the broiler production, pretty much like everybody else, we started off with the Salatin houses that we drug across the field. It didn't take us very long to figure out that that was not uh, the thing that we wanted to do. But eggs and broilers are the money makers at the lambs quarter because all the labor is in house. We don't have to farm any of that out. Here's a picture of the chickettes. Um, this is just, you know, not so much with um, operating a CSA, but just a side note. If you are into broiler production, um, spend the money, get good equipment. Your time is valuable. This is a shot of us pulling, um, moving chickens out to pasture in the crates. We usually do about 200 uh, in, at a time, and we have them on every four-week schedule. Always have a plan, not just for moving your animals on pasture, but for how you're going to sell them. Um, when I first came back to the farm and I was looking for how we make you know, how we're going to make money on the farm and started looking at vegetables. I remember one day when we were, uh, had all these radishes that were ready to pick and had no place to go with them. And so there they sat in the wheelbarrow um, and it was a rather pitiful sight. So, you know, got to have a plan to how to market um, all of your produce, all of your, everything that you're producing. 
remember that your meat needs a story. You've got to be different and you've got to sell that difference. For us, with our pork production, no gestation crates, no farrowing crates, non-GMO feed, pasture raised. Those are the points that we're driving home. Find out what your difference is, what your niche is in the market and sell it. On pasture, our chickens are raised on pasture. Uh, this is Chicken Palace 4.2. I think at this point, we're now up to Chicken Palace 5.3. Again, just an ever increasing uh, experimentation, try trying to get it just right. The difference between what we bring to the market and ultimately to the table versus conventional meat production is absolutely incredible. Your customer will be able to taste the difference immediately. While organic vegetables can claim long-term health and environmental benefits, small farm organically managed, humanely raised meats and eggs offer a difference you can taste immediately plus long-term health and environmental benefits. Make sure your customers know that. I just recently saw uh, a statistic, haven't had a chance to uh, do any background research on it, but it was that 50% of domestic lamb consumption is met by current domestic lamb production. There is a growth area. However, on our farm, uh, sheep have been probably the largest learning curve. And then you're probably wondering, well, isn't your name the Lambs Quarter Farm? But if you're a good farmer, you know that Lambs Quarter is a weed, a very nice, tasty, edible weed. Um, so there you go. Of course, with uh, if you are doing lamb production, you have um, are you going to do hair sheep versus traditional sheep? How are you going to sell it? Are you going to sell the whole lamb by the piece? You have to know your market and know your seasons. Nice little shot of uh, predators. Um, there's no such thing as free ride. Um, we, you know, we're just right outside of Washington, D.C., and yet our predator issues are huge. Um, always trying to find the best solution and this guy I caught uh, walking across the field with a chicken in his mouth. Uh, fortunately, I was there. This is a shot of our building project that uh, FACT funded for us through their Fund a Farmer uh, grant. And this is, uh, this is actually a chicken house, not mobile, it's stationary. It's essentially a 16 by 48 greenhouse um, and it's, been a uh, just a wonderful addition to our to our farm here. It'll hold about 300 chickens, um, and we can pasture them, rotate them around the structure itself. Some of the aspects for marketing: How are you going to get the word out that you've got a CSA or that you have product to sell? Uh, social media, um, localharvest.org is a good uh, website. You can uh, basically put a profile of your farm up there. Local newspapers, they're always looking for stories to print, human interest stories, what's happening in town, what's happening out in the country. And then your farmer's market customers. Again, don't try to turn all of your farmer's market customers into CSA customers. Um, but, it's also worth noting that a lot of times your farmers market customers will buy more product if they're then a member of your CSA. Structuring your CSA, um, again, how are you going to do that? In a couple slides, I'll expand on that a little bit. Um, what time period, what kind of pickup schedules are you going to have? How are you going to price it? Um, again, and your pricing, remember, what can I borrow money for? What, what is money going to cost me to borrow? And then communication. Communication is really key in a CSA. Uh, people join your CSA because they want a connection to your farm. 
So, weekly newsletter, wonderful idea. In the middle of the summer, sometimes it's almost impossible to get out because we're just so busy doing everything. Um, are you going to uh, meet all of your customers as they pick up every week? If you can, that's fantastic. You know, people want to see you and they want that connection with your forum. That's why they've joined. That's why they've given you money up front. Um, also, Facebook, Twitter account, all the social media tools, use them to your advantage. And then seasonal add-ons. We always do turkeys for Thanksgiving. So know your holidays for every religion. Know the people that are around you and market to them. And I got so excited about doing this program that I decided that I would run my Meet CSA one more year. And so this is what I came up with. Um, and hopefully this will give you some of the nuts and bolts of at least uh, my slant on how to run a CSA and meet CSA. So to start off, uh, introduce it. It's nice to have uh, a catchy name for your CSA or just your farm name. Ours is chicken and ribs because what we're trying to push here are our poultry products and our pork. Um, got a 26 week program which coincides with uh, th <clears throat> excuse me, three of my farmers markets. Actually, I do a year round market as well. So all coincides with all four of my farmers markets. Um, reaching out to the communities um, outside of the markets and having local drop offs where they can come right to that market. So basically have five pickup locations. And uh, you need to set a sign up period. You want the money up front. Um, so March through April be our sign up period. And then what are they going to get? What are your customers going to get for giving you money up front? Well, I have uh, a way that is broken down and it's pretty much an a la carte system here. I've got an egg share, a chicken share, and then three meat plans. Um, the egg share, 26 weeks, they get a dozen every week. Um, it's not a big savings, but it's something. Uh, typically what people, at least my customers will do is they'll grab the egg share because they don't want to run out of eggs during the middle of the summer where typically the hens lay off. My uh, egg share customers are guaranteed their dozen eggs. Chicken share, chicken every other week. Again, ours is based on a certain weight, my target weight, my regular price, uh, target weight being a four pound dressed bird. Sometimes my birds will get a lot bigger than four pounds and get to the definite roaster size of five and five and a half, but I've only charged for a $4 bird. Again, can be a big savings on that. And then the experiment this year is with the three meat locker plans. Um, the every other week box, the once a month meat box, and then what we've done in the past is just have a, a flexible spending account. Uh, you can look over those things. Again, let your customers know uh, what they're going to get, how much they're going to save, and um, their benefits. The, the plan here that I least like is the flexible spending account uh, because my experience has been some people, some of your customers will all of a sudden forget that they have this and they don't spend it and then you're at the end of the season and you've got money that they haven't spent. Uh, and you also, in all of these things, you have to be really, really good at record keeping. And Larissa, am I near my time limit? I think you should, you should have another five, at least five minutes, Jim, if you'd like to continue. Otherwise, okay. we can do whatever you like. All right, I, I really sped through my presentation here. I don't know if anybody has questions right now on, um, on what I've done 
or if we want to just uh, uh, move on to how. Yeah, I think we'll wait for all the questions at the end just so that um, uh, they're kind of all consolidated. Um, but yeah, that was a great presentation, Jim, and I'm sure that people will probably want to pick your brain about some of the <laughs> particulars. So at this point, I think Holly, I'm going to pass the mic to you. Holly Browder. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so my name's Holly Browder, and I and my husband, Chris, run a pasture poultry farm. It's called Browder's Birds. It's on the North Fork. It's the east end of Long Island. It's in Mattituck, New York. Uh, we're about 80 miles from New York City. Uh, we, we are certified organic by NOFA New York, and we produce pasture poultry and uh, eggs. And we also have a flock of sheep. We do a little bit of lamb. We do more wool, and we make clothing and sweaters and other accessories with our wool. Um, we also have ducks and we sell duck eggs and we have beehives, so we sell honey. But for our CSA, we mostly focus on our poultry. Uh, we've been farming for about eight seasons now. And for our poultry and eggs, we have a wholesale business, which is restaurants and retail. And then we have a retail business, which is our on-site farm stand. And uh, we do about six farmer's markets in the summer. We do one year round farmer's market. And then we have our CSA. And we've been doing our CSA for going on seven seasons now. Uh, as Jim has already said, it's a CSA is a community supported agriculture. It's the upfront purchase of a share in a farm at the start of the season. And in return, the member receives the weekly produce from that farm. And this is someone picking up a share at our farm. For our CSA, we actually do two. We do a winter egg share. Um, that's a 20 week share. We do two dozen every other week so that people don't have to come every week in the winter. It's the off season. It really helps us out. We have about a thousand laying hens, so we have a lot of eggs. And even though we have a wholesale business, everything tends to slow down in the winter. So we have to keep moving sales. It also just helps us keep our local customers coming back. Uh, it also is great that we have this year-round market so we can market our winter share at our farmer's market or at our farm. And this winter, we actually closed our farm stand in the off season just because it's really slow. But we were able to do, since the share is prepaid, we were actually able to do the winter share with just stocking the farm stand with eggs and having a sign-up sheet and people just self-serve on the weekends. It saved us so much time and labor. Everything was prepaid. It's actually still going on. Um, the winter share ends in another month, but it really helps us move those eggs in the winter. And it's, it's a lot less labor. Um, our summer share, we do chickens and eggs. They're separate shares. So you can sign up for both or one or the other. We do, we'd like to do 20 weeks. Um, it's just a nice time frame. We're very seasonal out here. So we hit the summer months where a lot of people are coming out and renting houses. Um, we have the Hamptons, which is where most of our farmers markets are. So it's really nice to uh, entice those people with a shorter CSA. Our chicken share, we actually do two options. Our full share is every week. So it's one chicken every week. Some people might think that's a lot, but a lot. We only we're a seasonal business with poultry, with the pasture poultry. So we actually encourage people to stock up. So near the end, they're actually putting their chickens away for the winter because we're not going to sell chickens year, year round. We tend to sell out by November and then we don't start again until the spring. Um, sorry, I just had something come up. Here we go. And then for people that can't commit to 20 chickens a season, we also offer a 10 week share. That's our half share. You can either do every other week. So you're only picking up two chickens a month. Or if you're a person that just rents a house for the summer out here, then you can pick up for 10 weeks. And that just kind of covers your time out here. And you don't have to worry about not being able to get your chickens once you've gone back to the city. And we do a summer egg share as an add-on or as its own standalone. And that's a 20-week share. You get one dozen eggs every week. The I think as Jim was saying, it's feast or famine. And in the summer, and we produce a lot of eggs, but they go very quickly. So people love the summer egg share because if they pick up at the farmer's markets, their eggs are guaranteed. They don't have to worry about getting there before 10 a.m. because we might sell out. They know they can take their time on Saturday morning and come get their eggs. I tend to not discount the egg share because of that, because it's a product that we're going to sell out of. So 
I see it more as um, a bonus or it's more of a positive that they're going to get their eggs. I used to feel like we had to discount that, but now I feel like they actually just pay retail. But I think for our customers, they just like the idea that it's a guaranteed pickup and they don't have to worry about not receiving their eggs when their company's coming for the weekend. Um, I always like to say with the chicken chair as well, most of our CSA members join every year and they're great customers and they're regular customers. You know, are they, they're probably going to always buy from us if we didn't do a CSA, but would they buy 20 chickens? Would they buy a chicken every week? I don't know. You know, maybe one week they'd say they're eating seafood for the weekend and they weren't going to get a chicken, but if they have that share and they've already paid for it, then they know, you know, they're going to pick up. So it really creates loyalty and it actually helps boost sales. Uh, some considerations when you set up a CSA, you think about the length of time. Most CSAs in our area, they run from 20 weeks to 26 weeks. Um, like I said, ours is a little shorter, but I just like the 20 week time frame. It usually works out with even numbers of product that they're receiving. You can think about the amount and the price. So is it a chicken every week? Is it a chicken every other week? Is it chicken and eggs together? And pricing, you know, I, I agree that it's nice to give a discount. It's nice to encourage people to sign up. I think once it becomes really popular or if you have a product or if you're in an area where it's easy to sell out, that maybe you don't necessarily have to give a discount. Maybe you can just, um, you know, offer the idea that they're going to get their product when they want it and they don't have to worry about it not being available. And there's maybe a benefit in that. But if you're able to offer a discount, I think, you know, it's a great way to attract customers. In my experience, they don't even notice. I don't think anyone's that many people have actually sat down and figured out if they were getting a little bit less money to sign up for the CSA or if they're just getting their product. And the nice thing about something like a chicken or meat where it's per pound is that whatever the amount is, you can decide that week, you can always figure out the right size chicken to give them. So, you know, every week we process poultry and it's all different sizes. So I can kind of fill the CSA niches so that they're getting the right amount. Um, you can think about the number of members. It's actually really important because when you start a CSA, you, you kind of get excited and you want to get as many people as you can. But you really have to think about your resources and where you can get product and your pickup locations, which is the next one, because sometimes you, you sign up too many people at a market. And to actually get the product to the market every week takes up a lot of space where you also have to do a farmer's market. So you also need to be able to fit product that you're selling at the market. So you really have to think about what's feasible. How can you have enough members to balance having enough product to sell? Because you still need those retail sales because they're going to bring in the money during the summer. Um, and then your pickup locations. We do pickups at the farm, which is the easiest. It's so great. You know, it makes more sense if you're going to do any discounts to offer them at the farm because people are coming to you. But we do also do pickups at the farmer's markets. We tend to go to locations within an hour of our farm. But there are transportation costs to consider. So there are markets where we would charge more because uh, especially places that are there's a lot of traffic in the summer and we know it's taking a long time to get the stuff there um, or there's extra fees to get there. With us, we have to take ferries sometimes to get to the Hamptons. So you can consider that with your location if you should be charging more at that location for the convenience for them. And then a no show policy because I know farms that do all different things. And we definitely know a lot of farms that just have, if you don't pick up, that you don't get your share that week. If you miss a week, they say they're donating, donating it to a food pantry. We tend to be a little bit more flexible because I know I, we can either freeze our product or just give them another dozen eggs next or chicken next week. So we tend to be really flexible that if you miss a pickup, you can pick up two the next week. Or if you miss two weeks or if you miss another week because of vacation, and, you can pick up when you get back. It's nice that we do that. We started doing that. Now we can't get out of it. It's a lot of administration. You have to know. I feel like at some point in the summer, I know everybody's vacation schedule of all my customers because people are constantly emailing me. And, and you really, it is a lot of administration because you don't want to send product to a farmer's market where somebody said they weren't going to be able to pick up and then it's sitting there in a cooler all day. Maybe it's really hot out and it, it's just not a great situation. So you kind of have to decide what's best for you. It's probably a lot easier to say, if you don't pick up, you know, you're missing your share, we'll donate it to a food pantry. 
but it's also hard because you know it's there's a lot of value that they're paying and you don't want them to miss out on their product the benefits for our farm for having a csa it's the capital at the start of the season we actually tend to open our csa up in december it's so hard because you just finished one season and you're so tired but if you can get it out in december it's a great Christmas gift, and I have to tell you, we get a lot of people that buy CSA shares for their friends or their family for Christmas. And we can, now that we've learned that, we actually promote it as a great gift. So if you can get your act together, and I know it's hard because you haven't even thought about the next season, but if you can get it out early, it, it will definitely, you can definitely get members around the holidays. Um, and then you can figure out your demand. You know, if a lot of if it's a new CSA and you get a lot of a great response, that's great. I mean, you're, you're probably going to have a good season. You can kind of decide. We look at the numbers for the CSA. We can decide how much more we're going to build into our season, knowing our other farmers markets that we do, knowing what our sales were last year. It just really helps for planning purposes. Uh, loyal customers, people in our CSA. I've had people in the CSA for six years or more. They're great customers. They like to come every week. They like the relationship. It's really amazing that you can build that relationship with them. I think they feel like they're part of the farm. They love the story. They love to go tell their friends about the story when they eat the chicken with them, um, when they pick up their eggs. And as I said earlier, I think a lot of these customers would come every week anyways, or they'd go to the market every week if that's where they pick up. But would they buy a chicken every week? Probably not. Some weeks they probably just come and say hi and talk to us. But when they're in the CSA, they definitely have already paid. So they come every week and pick up their product. And then guaranteed sales, you know, it's really great to have those sales guaranteed. I mean, it's so nice to start the season knowing that we've sold this many chickens at West Hampton Beach Farmers Market or this many chickens at East Hampton. Or So that's always nice to know, right, because the whole business is um, always a question mark. I mean, some weeks the weather's going to be terrible and then everywhere else your retail sales are going to be bad. But, you know, you've sold those CSA shares. So those people are picking up. The challenges of the CSA is definitely administration. This is the hardest part. You have to keep track of everybody, make sure they paid. And then if you have this policy, if you let people pick up, if you let people miss pickups or pick up at other times, you definitely have to manage that. Um, you have to make sure at all your markets there's an accurate pickup list because you're not always at every farmer's market. So whoever's working your booth, whoever from the farm has to know as well what's going on with the CSA that day. Um, the decrease in revenue in season, you know, it's so great to get the money early in the season when you need more cash flow. But it's interesting because some of our farmers markets that have a big CSA, they feel like they're sellout days. But because half of that product was prepaid back in April, that the revenue wasn't coming in at that market. So even though somebody comes back and we've sold out of everything, that market actually could make less than a market where the CSA is really small, but then there's a lot more product that's going to that market for retail. Um, and that's just balancing because, you know, I know smaller farms that started CSAs have had a hard time because they it's very easy to spend all the money up front. And then you're spending the entire season handing out product and not collecting any more additional money. And then space considerations. Um, the space considerations for transporting, that's just referring back to if you do a farmer's market pickup. It's definitely something to consider because for things like chicken and eggs, they have to be in coolers. Coolers take up a lot of space. So if you're going to a really busy market and you know you have a, you need to take a lot of product, that CSA suddenly takes up a lot of space in your coolers. Um, it can get frustrating in August, when it, well, for us, when it's very busy, when we know we have this much space to pack for the CSA, it only it only allows for so much more stuff to go to the market. So that's just something to consider. If you know you have a really strong market, you just might want to limit the CSA. I think like Jim was saying, not every regular customer needs to be a CSA member. Um, it's just great to have a lot of stuff to sell retail as well. Uh, the inherent risk, that's more for the customer, uh, but there is a risk that when someone signs up for a CSA, something could happen. You might have to end your season early. That's actually happened out here. We had a chicken share, uh, a chicken farm, a poultry pasture poultry farm that was their first season last year, and they actually had to shut down in the middle of the season, and their CSA got shut down. They've returned people's money, but those people really wanted chicken, so they were really upset. They 
didn't want their money back. So they, some of their customers called us, which was already in the middle of our season. And it, for, for us and for the customers, it wasn't as convenient. We didn't have the same pickup locations, but you know, those people had signed on hoping to have chicken all year. So there is that risk. And I'm sure it's a little bit of anxiety that if you can't fulfill your promises that, you know, you'll have to be holding to your customers. You'll have to make amends or return their money. And then it's a commitment. Um, if you're new, if it's a new farm, you know, you might want to wait a year or two to see how it goes before you start a CSA because, you know, you are signing a contract with them and they're paying and they're supporting your farm, but they're also expecting something in return. So if you think you're not going to be able to fulfill that, if you think you might not be able to do a full season, you know, if you might have things come up, uh, you know, you can't suddenly take off on vacation. You know, most people aren't going to do that because we have farms and we understand it. But, you know, a lot of new farmers, the idea of a CSA is very attractive. But the commitment, um, you have to be very serious about that. So and finally, ways to attract and retain members. Uh, so we've been doing this for a couple of years. It's always great to get new members because you do occasionally lose CSA members and more people start CSAs. Maybe you lose members to other farmers and maybe those farmers have better locations for your customers that makes more sense so we've done lots of different things to attract members you know one thing is offering perks jim is saying you can offer discounts um and i think that's great and i also think you can offer discounts at your farm stand we've tried we do lots of other products so you can give people a small discount on other products you could give them a first buy on other things like when we have lamb available it goes to our csa members first so they definitely get a little bit of vip status on our farm um csa picnics and farm tours the, the members love the farm and they love to tell the story about the farm and they love to feel a part of the farm so we've been doing things like picnics where they can all get together and talk and these are all like-minded people we've done tours special tours just for the csa members you know so they can learn more about the farm and where their food comes from and then they can go and tell that story to their friends, which always helps attract new members. The email reminders and the farm newsletter. We actually do a newsletter every Friday. We do it every Friday year round. It's an e uh, email newsletter. We use constant contact. We have been growing this list. It always tells us where the market, it tells everybody where the markets are, where they can find us that weekend. And then we always have a reminder in there for our CSA members because they need that reminder, especially in the winter when we do an every other week pickup, they need to be reminded, this is the week you pick up your eggs. So, and, and they definitely appreciate that. Then delivery services. We don't offer this in our CSA, but I'm seeing this uh, happening more and more at other CSAs around us where they're actually offering, and we're near New York City, so they're offering delivery to the tri-state area, whether they're hiring a driver to take it in there, or I've seen now people doing shipping and the shipping costs are included in the CSA. And you know, I think I think that seems extravagant, but I actually think people appreciate convenience. And so depending on your market and where you're located, there's a lot of people that will pay for pay for convenience. So maybe it's good to be the one that offers them an easy way to be a part of the CSA. And then workplace partnerships. We don't participate in this, but it's big around our area again because we're close to New York City, so you partner with a company or a corporation and you actually offer pickups at that spot so people can pick up on their way home from work. I think that's great. I mean, I think that makes it easy. That's the company offering you customers. All you need to do is coordinate. Um, I think it's really great to call companies and approach them if you have large businesses and offer that to bring your product there. Um, I think that's a great way to find customers and get people involved and also get people to eat healthier. And then partners with other farms. If you're doing eggs and meat, it's so easy to partner with vegetable farms. And there's so many great vegetable farms that probably already have a really strong CSA. And all you need to do is just um, find those farms and reach out and offer to do an egg share with them. Because we have a lot of, and we're certified organic, so we have a lot of certified organic vegetable farms around us that don't have animals. So it's really easy for them to uh, offer an egg share to their CSA members or a chicken share. And that's the easiest because then they're doing the administration and they're just telling you they're actually giving us the money up front 
and they're just telling us how many to deliver every week. So, and maybe they're marking it up or not, but that's up to them. But it's really, really, really easy for us on that side. Um, so I did go kind of quickly, but this is my contact information if you have any other questions, but those are just some of our experiences with our CSA and just some of the th trends I see happening with CSAs in general that I think, you know, if we want to grow our business, we should probably um, try to incorporate those. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Jen. Those are great presentations. I really uh, thank you for your insight and everything that you shared. Um, we are going to start the Q&A in just a minute, uh, but I have one last poll for you all. Um, let me just pull it up. So after watching the presentation, just a quick survey, and this is also um, blind, so no one will really know what you answered. How do you feel? Do you feel more in informed about operating a successful meat or egg CSA program about the same or maybe less, in uh, less informed? Just be honest. Let me know what your, your vote is. Excellent. So we have the grand majority of you all are feeling a little bit more informed about some of the challenges, some of the benefits, kind of the nuts and bolts of how to operate a successful program. Um, and now it's time to take your questions. So you all have the um, the chat bar on the left side of your screen. If you would kindly type any questions in, I will read them for um, Holly and or Jim to answer. So I actually have a question I'll start out with. Um, both of you, um, do you run into with, with the meat side of things having to have everything frozen? And how does that really, I know that was a, an impact with kind of the transportation side of things and the storage, but how do you deal with that? Um, Holly, do you wanna go first? Okay, well, we used to only offer frozen poultry for CSAs, but now we do both. Um, but fresh if available, because fresh seems to sell out at the farmer's market, so we're not going to hold fresh chicken at the market. But if you come early and we have it available, you can have it for your CSA, but we will always hold a frozen chicken for your CSA. Um, that's just a new thing. I mean, the fresh chicken is definitely harder to deal with than the frozen poultry. Um, at the farm, it's not as hard because we have two walk-ins, and one's a cooler and one's a freezer. Um, but... We don't guarantee fresh, so but that's a perk. If you are able to get a fresh chicken, you can take that as your share. If we only have frozen available, though, that's what you're promised. I, only, any... do. Yeah. I only do because of um, the markets that I go to require all my meats to be frozen, so it's just easier to keep doing everything the same way. Excellent. Okay. We have a question here about... Um, are your animals processed on the farm? Jim, do you want to go first on that one? Sure. Um, my chickens are because Maryland allows me to do that on farm processing. Everything else that I have, the pork, the lamb, beef, all has to be processed at a USDA uh, inspected facility. And we have a 5A license in New York State. Uh, New York State allows only 1,000 birds processed on farm every year, so we go above that. So we're inspected. We have a mobile slaughterhouse that is inspected by the state for game, poultry. Um, we can do turkeys, rabbits. We do game birds for another farmer. Um, and then all our red meat has to be processed off farm at a USDA facility. Thank you. Uh, could each of you give an example of a CSA sign-up perk? Uh, Holly, <laughs> I'll go with you first. I mean, the one thing that you could do is the pricing, as Jim said. And I actually kept last year's pricing up until now because we just redid our pricing for this season. So people that did buy shares at Christmas time were getting last year's prices. So they were able to buy the share at less money than people are gonna to have to pay now in the spring because now we're revamping prices for the year based on what everything's gonna cost this season. Um, so that's a perk. That's a way to get people to sign up early because I say, 
you know, sign up again, you're going to get last year's price if you do it right away. Um, but another perk we did is we gave 10% off at, at the markets on some of our value added products. Um, we, we haven't done that this season. We have so many products now, but we used to do that when we only had a couple extra things. And then just giving a slight discount on the product. Um, we still do offer a slight discount on the chicken share. Egg shares because eggs sell so fast now. We actually, it's just a, the same price as retail, but it's a guaranteed pickup every week. Jim, do you I have think, anything to add? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, um, for me, it's, uh, you know, like, like Holly said, I, I discount a little bit. Um, I'm trying to attract uh, larger families uh, with the discounts. Um, and Holly's uh, absolutely right with the eggs. You probably don't really need to discount the eggs. Just having them guaranteed um, is enough. Um, you know, the other the other perk uh, we've done in the past is to invite our CSA families, like Holly has done, to the farm for a farm a farm day uh, picnic on the farm. Uh, basically, your CSA customers really want that farm connection, as well as the stuff that uh, you're selling them. Uh, do you, uh, Jim, do you wash all of your eggs? That's a yes, question we have. Yes. Yes, yes I do. Uh, that's part of the Maryland regulation. It all, they all have to be washed. So every egg gets touched three times. Three times. Mm -hmm. And Holly? Yes, we wash all the eggs every day, just with water. Uh, and I have, there is a note here from another farmer that says that, um, it's good to check with your state or city health departments on the regulations for fresh and frozen, for sure, when you're definitely with the, the farmer's markets. Uh, I know in Chicago, everything has to be frozen. Um, question about, do you determine, or how do you determine weekly or biweekly or monthly? Um, I'll give that to Holly first. Um, well, we only offer it weekly That's or every right. other week. So we just give, you know, we just offer two different types of shares. Um, some some of it's a price point. Some people would rather pay a little bit less to get less. And some of it's where we live, it's very seasonal. So some of it's just more attractive to people that only have summer homes out here. So they're only going to be here for a short amount of time. Jim, I know you have a monthly option. I have a monthly and every other week. Um, and I also have that, that flexible spending account, um, which is absolutely horrendous in terms of <laughs> I can't imagine but, um, it's it is very popular because then um, you know it's up to the person when they want to buy and what they want to buy so again just just have your pencil sharp <laughs> and I, I would just add always have a CSA sheet and have them initial it because I always have people at the end of the season that come back and say they think they missed times or they can't remember if they picked up two after they were away. So if you have the sheet and I always have them sign it, you can always, and I always keep it all in one clipboard. I mean, it's very old fashioned. It's not that high tech and we can just flip through it and say, Oh, here's week two. Nope. You signed it. You were there. You picked up. So it just helps. And it's not anybody's fault. I don't think they're trying to cheat you. I think people just are busy in the summer and they forget what they did every week. So. Excellent. Uh, question about, do you sell kind of the the harder to, to sell pieces, like the feet and livers and such? Jim, I'll go to you first. Um, for me, it's a manpower thing or person power thing when I'm processing on the line. I'm doing a lot of my uh, uh, chicken processing by myself. So, no, I'm not saving them. Um, Sometimes I do get a little pushback from my customers, but the vast majority of my customers get it and um, seem to be okay with that. Uh, so we actually have a couple people slaughtering. We only slaughter one day a week, but we'll have enough people staffed that we have a, a line going in the slaughterhouse. But we save everything, but nothing comes with the chicken, so it's by the pound. Um, so we do sell livers, hearts, gizzards by the pound. In, in pre-packaged containers, and they're frozen. We always sell that stuff frozen. Uh, we sell feet frozen by the pound. We sell bones, necks and backs from all the cut-ups, because we also sell cut-ups um, frozen. 
And actually, the only thing we have left this time of year at our winter market is feet. But we sell a lot of feet right now because people love to make chicken stock this time of year. So they'll come and buy feet every week at the market just to make their stock really good. Yeah, and I've read about that in your in your month uh, your weekly newsletter too. It's good with the. Oh yeah, well I like I, I actually think you have to sell every part to make a profit if you can. So yes. we try not to waste anything anymore. <laughs> so question um, that came in about meat lo meat locker plans. Do you rent mm -hmm. a meat locker? And uh, someone's wondering about USDA storage of meat if you're processing a large amount of, for example, hogs. Mm -hmm. What do you all do? Um, let's see. I forget who who answered first last time, but I will go with. Well, I, I don't have I don't have pigs, so and yes. I don't really store any. I mean, if we have lamb, we freeze it. So I don't I don't think that pertains to me. Yeah. Okay. For uh, in Maryland, uh, the MDA will inspect our uh, on-site freezers and cert and certify them. We, it's part of the whole of our whole certification process for on-site uh, poultry processing. So yeah, they they come out, they inspect, we hold it. Um, one of the things I found, uh, just I've I've owned walk-in freezers, and um, I now rely on a um, about a dozen fourteen chest type freezers, and I sleep a whole lot better at night because of that. <laughs> Question about your meat CSA concept. Uh, someone was wondering if you are. Well, it sounds like you're you're keeping it, Jim, for another year, but you are considering not doing it again. Well, Do you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, What's that? My, I uh, I ran a a vegetable CSA, primarily a vegetable CSA, for about eight years. Um, had some transitions going on here at the farm. Uh, transition uh, from a vegetable CSA to primarily a meat CSA two years ago. And I will say, um, I found out how many of my customers don't really read what I send to them when I did that, mm -hmm. uh, because I had a lot of them sign up thinking it was still the same vegetable CSA. Uh, so that took a little bit of, uh, of working through. Um, and we did, we, we, we got everybody at least reasonably happy with what was happening. Uh, or, you know, refunded anyone's money that, that wanted it refunded. Um, last year, did not do a CSA at all. And then as I was preparing for the presentation um, tonight, I uh, realized that I met all of my criteria for doing a CSA. So I said, shoot, why not? Let's let's get this thing going. So that's what you see. <laughs> so he was inspired to continue. <laughs> Uh, question about what the price is going, what you you all are doing for selling a dozen eggs, um, or and the pound per of the meat birds, and keeping in mind that you know you you are outside of New York City and outside of Washington D.C. What does your do your product sell for? Uh, Jim, go with you first. Do you, I had to I had to pop off for a moment. Could you repeat that one? Oh me? yes. We just had a question about um, how much you are selling a dozen eggs uh, for, and the price per pound of meat uh, for the for the broilers. Okay, uh, a dozen eggs are five dollars, and I have my broilers priced at four fifty a pound. Uh, we do two types. Uh, we do two types of broilers. We do a white a white broiler, which is a Cornish cross. It's uh, six dollars a pound, and but we haven't changed that in a while. We might probably we're probably going to go up to six fifty this year because we've been we just haven't raised it in a couple of years. And then we do a, a more um, dark meat chicken. We call it a red broiler. Um, it's it, it grows slower, so there's a lot more labor and feed cost involved. And those are oh, I'm sorry. And so those are uh, sorry. Those are eight dollars a pound. Or other chickens are seven dollars a pound. I was giving you wholesale cost. Um, so Cornish cross are seven. Red broiler is eight dollars a pound. I think we're going to raise those both by fifty cents. It sounds like a lot, but we do. We're out where the land cost is really high out here, um, so people just pay more for vegetables. Everything costs more out here if you're going to support local. Our eggs are ten dollars a dozen at the farm, and then they're twelve dollars a dozen at the markets, which are mostly in the Hamptons. Um, 
And again, that's just, it costs a lot where we are. We're not making a ton of money on $10 eggs or $12 eggs, but, um, but you know, people buy them. So I'm just happy that people understand how expensive it is to farm in our area. Um, on that note, actually, there's a question about for you, Holly, how much, how much do you sell the feet for? And um, yeah, what, what would be a, a good selling point? This is okay. So we sell the Oregon. <laughs> We sell the feed for three dollars a pound. I, I think they probably at the butcher would be a dollar a pound. But you know, again, we're certified organic, so that also goes to our poultry. Our poultry certified organic, so they only get organic feed. Our eggs are certified organic. Um, that is a selling point, so we can charge more. So for our feed, we charge three dollars a pound. Um, and t people only tend to. I usually package them, prepackage them in about bags that are about five dollars. So it's it's pretty reasonable for someone to pay five dollars for a bag of chicken feet that they can make lots and lots of quarts of stock with. Right. Well, I hate to say it, but I think we're at the end of our, our time. <laughs> there were a couple other questions um, that I do have. I know that we didn't get to everyone's. I will pass them along to yeah. the presenters um, so that, that we can, of course, uh, respond to you offline. But um, I really do thank you all for joining us. A recording of this webinar will be available soon. Um, so it will be archived on our website and I'm also gonna email it to all of you. Um, and if you would be so so kind, um, please take a few minutes after this webinar uh, ends, there's a survey and you can sign up to receive Fund to Farmer email updates if you haven't already done so to learn about future webinars, scholarships and grant opportunities. Uh, just a friendly plug for our uh, free webinar series. We have several more coming up in March, including one next Monday, which is about tips for managing fertility, fertility disease, and pest control when you're rotating animals and vegetables, um, which is going to feature Tony Miller of White Feather Organics in Wisconsin. And then later in the month, we will be offering one a webinar about raising sheep and goats. So please, please, please join us for one or both of them. Um, a very, very sincere thank you to our presenters, Holly and Jim, for your excellent presentations and taking the time to answer our, um, these questions. And um, is there anything, any last words before we we sign off, <laughs> Holly or Jim, <laughs> that you'd like to add? <laughs> well, no, I know, but, <laughs> but we do hand wash all the eggs. <laughs> I'm reading this <laughs> question. <laughs> yes, Holly got a question about hand washing eggs, and they they do. I thought that was funny. <laughs> well, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening, whether you're on the East Coast, the West Coast, or somewhere in between. And we will be in touch soon. Thank you, thank you very much. Goodbye. So much. Bye bye.